Okay, the, the uh, section that we're going through today is what John skipped last month, uh, and that is the intertestamental period or between the testaments, whichever title you want to want to have. Uh, Malachi finished writing about 400 B.C. In, in round numbers. It was just before 400 B.C., or just after, I guess, 397 is what many say it was. And, oh, just a second, I've got to tell my phone to be quiet. Okay, good. There we go. I hate it when that goes off. It scares me. Okay. Uh, Let's turn to Psalm 74. Here is a verse that summarizes, actually a psalm to a large extent, that summarizes the intertestamental period. Because there's, after Malachi, there is no more of the Old Testament that's written. And then we're getting ready to start the New Testament. So there's a quiet period, in, you know, biblically, for 400 years. 400 years, four centuries, where there is nothing, God is not revealing anything. But there are important things happening during that time that set the stage for the New Testament. Now, the Jews, first of all, if we think back, the ten tribes of Israel have gone into captivity a long time before. Does anybody remember off the top when the fall of Samaria came, when the capital city of the northern kingdom collapsed and the final wave of captivity occurred? Anybody have that in your head? Well, fortunately, I do. <laughs> Round numbers, 720 B.C., 720 B.C. That's a good one. That's a good benchmark to keep in your mind. That's when the house, the house of Israel, the ten tribes, go into captivity. And then they're, they're out of the circulation within the, the promised land from then on. It was about 130 years later that the house of Judah fell. For the same reason, because they'd gone into idolatry of every kind and paganism. Uh, six, or 586 B.C., was the fall of Jerusalem. Now, there had been preliminary captivities that took place before that because the Babylonians had made Judea, uh, or the house of Judah, they made the house of Judah a vassal kingdom. In other words, you pay us a tribute of exorbitant tribute every year, and we won't beat you up. You don't pay that tribute, we're going to thrash you and destroy your city. And that's, that's what they did. So 586 was when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. Now we have all 12 tribes in captivity, one place or another. But the Jews are all in Babylon. The the northern ten tribes, by this time, they were taken to Assyria, which was further north uh, up. um, Babylon would have been in modern-day Iraq. In fact, the the city still is in what is modern-day Iraq. But the ten tribes were north on the Euphrates. Iraq actually sits astride both the Tigris and Euphrates, the two rivers that come down through the Middle East there to the Persian Gulf, and Iraq sits on both of them. Iran, their border is just on the, on the, uh, the east side of the Tigris. But if you follow the Tigris way up to the north, almost just up to where you're even with the bottom of the Caspian Sea, That was where the capital city of Nineveh was for the Assyrians. And that was the area the the ten tribes were taken. Up further north, in the headwaters of the Euphrates and the the, uh, Tigris rivers, was one of their places of captivity. Another place was on the eastern border of Assyria, which would have put them in the cities of the Medes. So they were further north and further east, then the Jews were taken. The Jews were taken almost due east over into to Babylon. Just for, just for perspective, uh, and we'll do sometime a Bible study or two on just Bible geography, and I'll, I'll bring some maps uh, and get a handout for you. 
on that regard. So now we have them all in captivity, and they're, the captivity of the Jews is going to be shorter than that of the northern ten tribes. But notice how this psalm starts, Psalm 74, one. O oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you purchased of old, your inheritance, which you have redeemed. And then over in verse 9, we do not see, oh, let's go back to verse 8. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them all together. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. So that's, that is what has happened in Israel by this time. This, this psalm was fulfilled, or perhaps this psalm was what we call a post-exile psalm. It was written after the Jews were exiled. It may well have been that. We do not see our signs in verse 9. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. So this is what the, the intertestamental period will be summarized by. Now, the Jews in captivity still had prophets for a period of time. Jeremiah was preaching when Jerusalem fell. I mean, he was literally in Jerusalem when it fell in 586 B.C. Ezekiel had been taken in an earlier captivity, and he was preaching and writing contemporary with Jeremiah, right right during the time of Jeremiah. And so was Daniel. So you had these three, three major prophets operating, and then they went into captivity, and Jeremiah went down, was taken into Egypt, and from there he went to Ireland later on. That's not in the usual histories. That's in the Celtic histories that take Jeremiah there. Uh, the uh, Ezekiel finished his writing and then falls silent after Jerusalem has fallen, a few years after Jerusalem fell. But Daniel is alive when the Jews are allowed to begin to be, you know, alive for a long time afterward. Ezra and Nehemiah come on the scene. And they are the ones through whom God sends back a 50,000 person colony of the Jews. Others follow, but the first wave is 50,000 return to Jerusalem, begin to rebuild Jerusalem, but specifically the temple. Then Nehemiah has to come later to get them to finish the walls around Jerusalem. And even later than that, by 516 B.C., the temple is rebuilt. And that included Zechariah's writing about that time, and Malachi wrote after that. And so ultimately we come down to about 400 B.C. when the final, of the, the final prophets of the minor prophets get there, finish their writing, and we have a time when there are no prophets, as was implica- implied here in verse 9 of se- Psalm 74. Now, there aren't many scriptures we're going to go through from now on because we're leading up to the New Testament scriptures. The key to understand what happened during the time between the Testaments <coughs> has to do with which empire was governing the Jews. And when you understand those, that's how we'll break it up. Uh, Babylon was destroyed or conquered uh, in the days of Daniel by another kingdom, another empire. What empire was that? Anybody have that in mind offhand? What? Did you, you speculated. Yeah, that was the time it happened because when they were having the feast, when they saw the handwriting on the wall, which freaked them all out, um, the the next empire was diverting the Euphrates River so they could come in under the river gate, which they did, and and conquered the city. That night, that night they conquered the city. Bingo. Yes, it was Persia. Thank you, Vincent. Now, uh, the, and, and the first king was Cyrus, prophesied in Isaiah to be the one that would be, in essence, a, a type of savior to the Israelites, and in this case to the Jews. He sent 
the Jews back. Uh, the Persians were different than the Babylonians. The Babylonians and the Assyrians were cut much out of the same bolt of cloth. They didn't tolerate anything except what they were. And if you aren't like us, then we don't like you. The Persians were, ah, okay. Everybody can, whatever religion you believe in, go and go back to your homeland because they had all these, these exiles from different places. Go back to your homelands and set up shop and recolonize your homeland, whatever religion you were, you can be, just pay your tribute, pay your tax, and we'll be happy with you. So the Persians were, in that sense, much more enlightened, I guess, than Babylon had been. So the Israelite or the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem and do the rebuilding. Now, that lasted, the, the Persian period, just for perspective, started in 536. That's when Cyrus, well, 538, actually, uh, and down to 333 B.C., 538 to 333 B.C. Now, since it was 397 B.C. that this intertestamental period began, you can see that a good chunk of the Persian rule of the Jews uh, is included in that time, down to three, about uh, 60 years. So the Persian period is also the time of Esther. You remember that uh, the book of Esther takes place. That was during the Persian period. Her husband was Xerxes. Ahasuerus is the Greek way of saying Xerxes. And uh, he, like his father, had been trying to conquer the Greeks and like his father, they didn't know how to sail. So the Greeks managed to get them trapped with a massive fleet. They thought, sure, they could overwhelm the Greeks. What they overlooked is the fact that Greeks knew their own water better than the Persians did. And so they, they were just totally destroyed, the army of the Persians, and Xerxes was not happy. So he came back and uh, needed a new wife, and that's how Esther ended up being his wife and delivered the Jews from a, another persecution that was taking place, one after the other after the other. So that was a fairly enlightened time that lasted until 333 B.C., other than the times of you know, uh, Haman and, and various other ones. Then Alexander the Great was rising to power. So this is a, a major influence that is taking place. Alexander the Great comes to power in 320 B.C. And then by the time he gets to Persia, ten years later, he just completely overwhelms the Persians. Alexander had all the Greek cities united under him. His father took care of making sure that happened. For extra credit, does anybody know Alexander's father's name? Yes, Philip, yes, good. Uh, they were Macedonians, <clears throat> right on the northern edge of Greece. Alexander brought with him not only his Greek forces, but he had a lot of the Scythian forces. So when we did the tribe trackers, the Scythians were Israelites. And they were the mounted archers. And they were a very effective tool in Alexander's uh, armies. So they were going back over to some place they'd already been, or their ancestors had already been. Alexander uh, got down to Tyre. Now, so I want to tell this story. This is an important one, and it explains why he was so benevolent to the Jews. He got to Tyre, uh, which is on the, up in where Lebanon is today, and the Tyronians were holdouts. They were pretty tough, you know, being in that seacoast, they could resupply from the ocean, and they were withstanding his siege for a long time. So he sent a message to the high priest in Jerusalem. He said, send me an army to reinforce my troops. And the priest didn't want to get involved. He didn't want the Jews involved in, this, in Alexander's wars. So that really upset Alexander. So he was bent on the absolute destruction of all the Jews and Jerusalem. And as soon as he conquered Tyre. Now, all of his local, all the local cohorts 
that were constantly at odds with the Jews and, and wanted to destroy them too, they, they were gleeful because they intended to be right there to get all the spoils, take the slaves, gather the money, etc., and so on. When Alexander came down then, uh, he, he sent a message warning them that he was going to invade the land, and the high priest, whose name escapes me at the moment, had no idea what to do. So he went and prayed all night for some inspiration, and finally God gave it to him. So he came out, he told all of his fellow priests, dress in your finest priestly uniforms. I'll dress in the high priest uniform. I want all the people in, dressed in white, and we are going to meet the emperor outside the city gates. And we're not going to meet him as an army, but as a people. Well, you know, that's putting your faith in God to protect you. And, you know, God was inspiring him. So that's where they were. And as Alexander's army, with Alexander in the lead, along with some of these other uh, kings of smaller kingdoms who had allied themselves with him, as they came up to Jerusalem, here you have the spectacle of all these people dressed in white, and then the priests in their uniforms, which are, you know, particularly stand out, the linen uniforms. And the high priest has not linen, also, not only the, the white linen, but then the purple of the, the, the priestly robes. And the high priest was the governor of the land. Uh, if I back up, I'll finish, finish Alexander's story in a minute. But by the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, when they went back, before the Old Testament is over, you did not have David's heirs sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. They were governed by the priesthood because David's line had gone. Zedekiah was dead. His sons were killed. Only his daughters survived. And that was the normal line of lineage. But it seemed to be that the bulk of David's line was just gone. It wasn't with the Jews anymore. And it had gone. It had been overthrown by one of the overthrow, overthrow, overthrows of Jeremiah's time. It was in Ireland. That's where it was and elsewhere up there. Ultimately leading to uh, providing the royalty for, the, uh, for Great Britain in due course. So the line of David was gone and the, the priests were now the governors of the land. They were not, the, they were not royalty. They called themselves princes because they didn't want to be called kings. <coughs> David's line was the kingly line. Excuse me. Um, so going on, we have now back to Alexander's conquest of Jerusalem at about 330 B.C. Or 327, it's somewhere in there. Uh, as he came up to Jerusalem, everybody's standing outside the city gates, That's and outside the walls. That's unusual. And then he spotted the centerpiece, which was the priesthood, gathered in a group, all arrayed in their finest uniforms, and the high priest in the center of that. And so the these other sub-kings were gloating uh, and riding as close as they could to Alexander because that meant that they were of higher status. And finally, he stopped because he was, he was fuming by the time he got up there. But he stopped and he stared at this. And this is how the story goes. Then he told them to stay there where they were, back away from the city. And he rode alone up to where the high priest was. And then he got off his horse and bowed down to the high priest. And then he, he dismissed his army from their attack formation entirely, and they encamped before they would go on to other conquests, he went into the city on his own and counseled with the high priest and had the book of Daniel read to him, which was very interesting because it showed one particular chapter where, you know, the uh, uh, <clears throat> you have the Medes and the Persians they were the goat with two horns and a ram, or the the, the, the the ram with two horns and a goat with one horn comes charging across and smashes into them. In other words, the Greeks would conquer the Medes and the Persians. So that was that was important news for Alexander. 
The reason why he had this change of mind when he saw the people standing there, and the high priest especially, is he had had a dream. This is recorded in the Greek histories. He had had a dream when he was in Greece that someday he would see a man, and he remembered the uniform and the hat, and you know the, the mitre they wore on his head, and the name blazoned, which was the name of God, on there. And when he saw that, he saw his dream fulfilled right before his eyes. So apparently God had communicated you know, or set, you know, seeded a dream in the mind of Alexander. That's not the only emperor, non-Israelite emperor that he's done that with or king that he's done that with before. Remember, Pharaoh had dreams. But he saw the dream fulfilled, and so he stood. He had his army stand down. There was not going to be a battle. And he treated the Jews with great respect. Alexander did. Unfortunately, he only lived a few more years before he died in 333. So the Greek period, however, took over from this point forward um, until uh, 333 to 323 B.C., he treated the Greeks very well, and then when he died, uh, his, his empire was broken into four pieces. Lysamachus, Cassander, which were over in Greece, Macedonia, and part of Asia Minor, and then the Seleucid line, S-E-L, C-U, uh, where is the list? I've got it written down here someplace. S-E-L-U-C-I-D, for all practical purposes. We won't count it wrong if, I'm, if we misspelled it. And then the Ptolemies, which is actually P-T-O-L-M-E-Y. They had Egyptian holdings because he had already conquered Egypt. So they got to rule Egypt. That was one of his generals. And then the Seleucid king got to govern Syria, the north and off to the east as well. <coughs> so those became the king of the south, were the Ptolemies, and the king of the north were the Seleucids. And when you read Daniel chapter 11, there's a very detailed chapter written 300 years before it all unfolded of the battles between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. Back and forth, back and forth they went as a foreshadowing of the beast power and the king of the south, the beast power in the end time, in our day, sometime, soon it looks like, sooner and sooner it looks like, there will be a king of the north who will come against the king of the south because the king of the south had been pushing at him. So the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, Ptolemies in Egypt in the south and Seleucids north and Based, they were based in Syria, so therefore north of Jerusalem. Their holdings were extensive. Sometimes they ruled most of Asia Minor, and extensive holdings way out into Iran, Iraq territory, Persian territory of the day. So they then, that, that would be called the, uh, the Greek period would be Alexander's reign, and the immediate time after his death, Again, the Jews were treated well at that time. Uh, they're in, in the Promised Land as well as in, cap in the area of their captivity. Many did not return from the area of Babylon. They stayed there. Many came back. But bear in mind, even, even Peter traveled to Babylon, and he wrote back to the brethren in Bithynia and Cappadocia and Upper Galatia, when you read in First Peter, he was writing back to his home churches because that's where his primary base was, up on the shores of the Black Sea. But he traveled to Babylon because it was still a city and there were brethren there. And the reason there were brethren there, the apostles were sent to the 12 tribes. The Jews were there and so were some of the other scattered remnants of the tribes. So... Uh, with that in mind, then there would have been Jews that were still in the Babylonian, what had been the Babylonian Empire, and they began to move into various areas. The Jews began to move out into other parts of uh, the Greek Empire as it existed then. Later they would expand into various locations in the Roman Empire. 
So we are, the Greek period ends in 323 and the Egyptian period begins. Initially, the Ptolemies or the Ptolemies out of Egypt governed Palestine. And generally speaking, they treated them with respect. They were harsh to a certain degree. Uh, let's see, their first emperor or first king down there, first king of the south, was Ptolemy Soter, S-O-T-E-R. He started out dealing very harshly with them, and then later he became just as friendly. So he came more around like Alexander was. Uh, the second Ptolemy, his successor, was Ptolemy Philadelphus. And he continued the favorable attitude toward the Jews. In fact, during Philadelphus' time was when the Septuagint version of the Old Testament was made. Now, I don't know if you have that in your, your vocabulary, but it's a good thing to know. The Septuagint was a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. The reason for that is that the Jews had spread out into all the Greek part of the world, including and especially Alexandria, Egypt. Alexander liked them, and they could they could be and they would be considered citizens and treated well in Alexandria. Many of them ended up down there. Alexandria in Egypt, that's where the great library was, probably because the Jews were there as well as the Greeks. But Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, in New Testament times, had more Jews by far in that city than there were, according to most historians, in all of Judea. There was a larger population of the Jews down there. So because there were so many Jews that were now speaking Greek, they felt that the the, the Sanhedrin, or rather the uh, the priests, believed that it needed to be done. That would have been about 200 B.C. when that took place, right toward the, the end of the Egyptian period. So they made the Septuagint translation, and when you note in your margins, uh, in your Bibles, at certain points, the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. And, and then you go back and look up the place back in the Old Testament, and you think, well, the, yeah, it's, that's the same Statement, but there's a word or two that are slightly different. It's because it's taken from the Septuagint. And you find that notated in most study Bibles will mention that it's quoted from the Septuagint. Sometimes it was quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures, sometimes from the Septuagint. So it appears that Christ and the apostles were completely conversant with the Septuagint, which meant that they at least could, uh, they could speak or read Greek some doing it better than others. Paul was particularly good in Greek. So that, that occurred during the Egyptian period from 323 to 204 B.C. The Egyptian period that when the Jews were ruled by the Ptolemies. They weren't ruled by Egyptians. These were Greeks. These were the Greeks that were ruling the Egyptians. They also ruled the Jews. And that was started in 323 B.C. and ended in 204 B.C. Remember, we're counting down. Um, now, we come to the Syrian period. By Syrian, I mean the Seleucids, the king of the north. Because the, the Ptolemies got weakened uh, by about their fourth or fifth regent down. And then there was a very strong king among the Seleucids at that time. They were based, as I said, they were based in Syria, so we refer to it as the Syrian period. But the Syrian period means they weren't Syrians, they were Greeks, who also who ruled the Syrians and ruled the Jews. So we're still dealing with the, the remnants of Alexander's empire in that sense. So the first king that ruled them was Antiochus the Great. And because they had a weak and young king in the south, he managed to get, take away Judea and some of the other territories the Ptolemies had ruled. Then they, uh, there were two points of special note in this period. First, this was the time that Palestine was divided into the five sections we, we read in the New Testament, 
and the uh, we, you hear them referred to sometimes. Judea, of course, that's obvious. Samaria, remember Philip went up to Samaria from Judea, and then Peter and John had to go to Samaria. Galilee is another section, and then Perea. Well, you know where Galilee is. That was up around the Sea of Galilee. Samaria would have been immediately south of that. Judea would have been immediately south of that. Perea, like uh, P-E-R-E-A, is also mentioned. Perea is where Christ stayed sometimes. That's where John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River. That was down in the Jordan Valley. And then the fifth one was Trachonitis. Or Trachonitis. T-R-A-C-O-N-I-T-I-S. And... My mental map escapes me at the moment, so I haven't a clue where it is. But we can look it up in a New Testament. New Testament map is probably on there someplace. Uh, Trachonitis. Perea. Ah, yes. All right. So if you're up in Galilee and you look to the east and you see the Golan Heights, that is Trachonitis. That's where Trachonitis was. So those were the administrative divisions of the land that were established by the Seleucids uh, when they they took over uh, governing from the north, from from the area of Syria. Now, uh, just for reference, when you see Judea mentioned, sometimes in the New Testament that means Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Sometimes they're lumped together. But when it's... You have to catch that by context or uh, study Bible or something. Otherwise, it is there's Judea, and there's Samaria, then there's Galilee, and there's Perea, which is down where Jericho was on the Jordan River at the north end of the Dead Sea. And then there's Trachonitis, which is uh, the Golan area, or the, the uh, area where the half-tribe of Manasseh and Gad would have been, up in, on the east bank of the Jordan in that direction. Now, the Seleucids were dirty, rotten scoundrels. uh, And they treated the Jews very harshly. The only thing that they did allow them to do is that they were permitted to live under their own laws. They did not try to impose their Greek or Syrian laws on them. They did allow them to live under their own laws administered by the high priest, who was the governor of the Jews. So they allowed that. However, it was during that time that we had the rise of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus, this is a good one to remember his name, A-N-T-I-O-C-H-U-S. A-N-T-I-O-C-H-U-S, Antiochus. Epiphanies is, you know, like a revelation. You have an epiphany, so that's what it's referring to. Um, is E-P-I-P-H, Epiph, E-P-I-P-H, and then A-N-E-S, Epiphanies, Antiochus Epiphanies. Now, he ruled... From 175 to 164 B.C. And he terrorized the Jews. He was a very evil leader. Jerusalem was plundered. The wall was torn down. The temple was desecrated. Temple sacrifices under his rule were abolished. He set up... uh, a uh, statue of Jupiter in the Holy of Holies. They offered swine's blood on the altar of burnt offerings. This is referred to as the uh, abomination of desolation in, in one aspect of the abomination of desolation. He completely insulted the Jews. He tried to make the Jews become Greeks. And many of them started to do that. But not all of them. Bear in mind, Israelites, you always seem to have two minds. Some want to try to do what God wants them to do, albeit imperfectly. And others try 
to assimilate whatever culture they're in. They like to go and be a pagan or a Greek. Greek Greeks were pagans, so they're going to be Greek pagans this time instead of Babylonian pagans or Canaanite pagans or Persian pagans. So Antiochus Epiphanes treated them very badly. However, that then raised the ire of the faithful Jews. And so we, we, as Antiochus Epiphanes is brought down, there was a battle that took place from 168 to about 165. He began to lose his hold over the, the Jews. There was a high priest named uh, Matthew, Maccabeus was his last well, no, he didn't have a last name. Just Matthew was his name. He had five sons. The middle son's name was Judas. And it was, that was the key son because he led the Jews in a revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, which resulted in a three-year guerrilla war. His brothers joined in, and his father was a part of that. Uh, and, you know, by this time, the... The sacrifices had been shut down by Antiochus Epiphanes as a foreshadowing of how they will be shut down. You know, there will be an end of the morning and evening sacrifice in some way, which sounds like there has to be sacrifices again before the return of Christ for a period of time, and then they're stopped. But Judas became known as Judas Maccabeus. Maccabeus is the Hebrew word for hammer. He was known as Judas the Hammer, the, old, the, the Thor of the Jews, as it were. He hammered the Greeks with his guerrilla warfare tactics, pounded on them, and ultimately broke their will to rule and chased them out of the country. Then Judas died in battle, but his brothers ruled successively for a period of time, not terribly long but for a period of time. They were known as the Hasmonean family. Uh, that was their, their Hebrew family name. Uh, and their, he, he ruled and his brothers ruled, and then the sons of some of the brothers ruled for a period of time. So the Maccabean period, and Maccabean is uh, M-A-C-C-A, Macca, and then Bean. B-E-A-N, pronounced Maccabean, <clears throat> from 165 to about 163 B.C. Or rather, one, sorry, 165 to 63 B.C. It's almost 100 years, almost 100 years. They... They had a back-and-forth battle with the, the Syrians. Sometimes the Syrians would gain territory in Judea, and sometimes the Maccabeans would then push them back. So it was a time of Jewish independence, almost a century long, from 165 until 63 B.C. But in 63 B.C., we have another family coming on the scene. And that one is uh, the Herod family. The first Herod, his name was Antipater. Anti for anta, uh, which means against, and then Pater, which I think means father. So against father. I don't know. That's an odd name for this guy. But he was an odd guy. Uh, not any odder, however, than his son. Uh, Antipater uh, was the father of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one that built the new temple, or rebuilt the temple, the second temple. And then he rebuilt Jerusalem to a large extent. He built Caesarea Philippi uh, out on the coast. He rebuilt an awful lot of different places and really made this country much more beautiful by his building projects. And he murdered his family, all of them, all of his kids, all of his wives. He was a psychopath, psychopathic architect, and a tyrannical ruler. As long as you did what he said, you were okay. If you 
disagreed with him in any way, you were dead. And, and he is also the one who destroyed all the children in Bethlehem around the time that Christ was born. That was the Herod that the Magi were interrogated. He interrogated the Magi to find out why they were there. And good reason, too. The Magi came from Parthia. Parthia was an empire that was on the other side of Judea, out to the east, in what would be Iran and Iraq. It had basically taken over the old Persian Empire to a large extent. Parthians were ruled by Scythians. Uh, so the Parthians themselves were Scythian. They were Israelites. They ruled the Persians. They ruled whoever else was out there, but they themselves were Israelites. And there were many Jews in the Parthian Empire, plus all the other remnants of the other tribes. And the Magi, the wise men, came from there to pay homage to Christ when he was a tiny baby. And then Christ, of course, was evacuated swiftly by Joseph and Mary down into Egypt by God's command and by the dream that Joseph was given. And, and then they came back to their homeland up in Galilee later up to Nazareth after the danger had passed because Herod, God obviously knew what Herod planned to do. So we come down to the Roman period of the inter of between the testaments and this is when the Roman Empire dominated the promised land and it started in 63 BC and went up to about 4 BC Christ was born 4 BC by all, almost all reckonings you think well how could you be born before your time yeah well that's easy the guy who came up with the BC and AD business did that hundreds of years later and when he did his history work, he was off. Later historians realized that, and so then they date Christ's birth at 4 B.C. instead of 0. When we were at the Big Dig in Jerusalem, this had happened more than once, but it would happen in 1973, we were divided into holes, groups of students, ABC or ambassador students, working in different holes. Literally, we all started out on the level at the beginning of the summer, and by the second or third day, they had, they had string where they marked out our hole. We were a hole. We just start digging straight down and discovering whatever there is to discover as we went. So later in the summer, one day we, uh, we had a sort of a, a ridge between our two holes, the next one over, and they all got out of their hole to go and get a drink of water. It was water break time. So one of the other fellows and myself, with the agreement and collusion of, of the girls and the other guys in our, in our dig spot, we found somebody had a piece of clay that was not of any antiquity value. It was a flower pot that got broken, and they picked it up and suggested the idea. So the other fellow and I grabbed a rock, a sharp rock, and we scratched 4 B.C. In English, you know, the 4 B.C., in, in, in our numerals and our letters and periods in the appropriate places, and we rubbed it good then with the dust so it looked old. And we hopped over into the other hole and found a place we knew they were digging. And we slid it just under a little, about half inch of dirt, knowing they would find it after the water break. And they did. And they were all excited. And they sent somebody to run and get the dig boss, you know, the Hebrew University archaeologists who were supervising our groups down there. And we were just dying with laughter. And they stopped their excitement briefly, and they heard the laughter. And then it dawned on them they'd been had. <laughs> How could you have a piece of pottery marked 4 B.C. <laughs> when whoever was marking it wouldn't have known that it was B.C.? Oh, a bit of fun. Anyway, the Roman period goes right on up to 4 B.C., and then the New Testament is underway. The Romans, of course, governed Judea until 70 A.D., Actually, longer than that. They governed Judea, oh my, into the two, three, well into the 300s, well into the 300s or later, A.D. They fought battles with Rome. Oh, we'll get to that, the, the, Roman, the Roman wars. I'll, I'll add that on to, to this message here in just a couple minutes. Well, let's go back to the Herod family. We have Antipater, who is the father of Herod the Great. 
what he did in order, because he, he didn't really have the power to conquer the Jews. Now, the Herods were partly Jewish, but mostly they were Edomite. Uh, what was the term? The Udameans or Edom? Um, is escaping me, but it means Edom. They came from down in the ancient area of Edom. The reason they were attached and had some political influence is because under the Maccabean family, which was a priestly family, and the priests were governing the nation at the time, they were also adding to the size. So they had conquered ancient Edom and added it to Palestine. They increased the, t- the territory of their holdings. They were, you know, in active conquest. Antipater came along and found an ally that could turn the tables and give him the political hierarchy of the area, and that was Rome, in the person of General Ptolemy. Or, uh, yeah, Pomp- sorry, General Pompey, P-O-M-P-E-Y. Pompey is what they say sometimes, but Pompey was his, the way it's apparently said in Latin. <coughs> Excuse me. So Pompey conquered it uh, in the name of Rome, and then he set up uh, Antipater as a client king. In other words, he ruled the area for Rome. And that, that agreement was to exist for some period of time. There would be a Roman presence because there would be a Roman governors of part of the area uh, and a Roman army there enforcing Rome's hold on it. But the Herods were client kings in the sense that they ruled at the request of the Romans or they ruled at the request that the Romans made because they asked them to. When uh, Antipater assigned his own son, who was uh, his son by marriage to an Arabian princess. So he was part Arab, Herod the Great was. Then, uh, (coughs) excuse me, I got a bit of bronchial pneumonia during the feast, and it's still just in the process of departing. Herod himself was appointed king of Rome about 40 B.C., about 40 B.C., Herod the Great. And then he had other sons that, uh, uh, or, or successors that ruled after him. Now, Herod the Great increased the splendor of Jerusalem quite significantly during his time, as I mentioned. So we have Jerusalem being built during the Antipater and especially the Herod the Great period being built up into what we read about in the four Gospels and the book of Acts. So that gives us, that gives it a little bit of the political background and who the Jews were governed by. Uh, you know, the, the Herods worked with the Jewish system. They didn't work against it. They were at least wise enough not to be like Antiochus Epiphanes. They let the, the, uh, the priests continue to rule, although by this time we had not just the priests. Let's look at the partly political, partly religious aspect of this period. When the Jews were into captivity and Malachi finished his writing and the events of Esther had taken place, we're down to 400 B.C., then we have the rise of some new institutions among the Jews in captivity as well as those in Judea. But particularly, uh, some of it is in in captivity, some in in Judea. The The very strict Orthodox Jews of that era would have been, early era, would have been called the Hasidim. They became known by the New Testament times as the Pharisees from the Hebrew word peresh, which means to separate. So it began, was pronounced Pharisee. These were not generally the priests, although there were some who were priests. The Pharisees were super strict and wanted to separate the Jews from everybody. 
the bulk of the priests were Sadducees. Now, I make a joke. The Sadducees, the, the priests and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees doctrinally were different as well. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Apostle Paul had been a Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as he has said himself. And at one point, he was in a tug of war among the Jews, and so in order to, to prevent himself from being you know, executed on the spot, he called out to the Pharisees that he was a Pharisee and that he was being judged in regard to the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. They had some truth. That was part of it. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believed that what you got in this life was all there was, which is a, the old joke, that's why they were sad, you see. But that's not why they were called Sadducees. They're called Sadducees technically because they're named after the faithful priest that served David, Zadok. Z-A-D-O-K in the Old Testament. Sadok, you could use an S in place of the, the uh, Z. So they were named after Sadok. So they were the Sadducees in that sense because they were priests out of the line of Zadok, going clear back to the time of David. But they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They had developed a, a philosophy that only the writings of Moses were inspired and the rest of the Bible was of little significance. Now, and that seems like crazy. Yeah, it was. But what did the Pharisees believe the Bible was? Well, they believed in the entire Old Testament. The Pharisees did. You think, well, that's good. Oh, yeah, but they went beyond that. They believed in all of the writings uh, of the Jewish rabbis, which were not writings until 200 years later. Uh, the oral law, in the time of Christ, it was called the oral law. They knew it by rote, by heart. And it added to all kinds of regulations that added to God's law, whereas the Sadducees took away great sections of God's word. And God said, you shall not add to nor take away. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were both wrong in that sense. <clears throat> However, it was during the intertestamental period that these two power groups rose. The Pharisees did not get their start until about 96 B.C. when the priesthood had been primarily the writers. They were the ones who could read and write. Uh, and... So they and therefore they were the they were scribes. A scribe means one who writes. <clears throat> they got wealthy enough that they did not need to write anymore for other people. So they taught some regular Jews how to write. Well, when you educate people and give them capabilities, you give them power. So over the course of time, these regular Jews who could write, now became scribes, experts in the law. They could read it, they could argue it, which they loved to do for, you know, days on end. <clears throat> and that gave them political power. So that, that's what gave the power to the Pharisees, is the fact the Sadducees taught them how to read and write. Up to that time, mostly the, the priesthood did the reading and the writing. But from about 100 B.C. onward, the Pharisees began to have that power. So then they became the two primary, primary political powers in the New Testament area. There were also the Herodians. The Herodians were the Jews who were, who were significantly secular and who allied themselves with the Herods. Uh, there were other, two other smaller groups that rose out of this, the Zealots and the Essenes. And both were more nationalistic groups. The zealots were actually assassins. They would assassinate anybody they didn't like. And uh, so they, they, they caused a problem. Uh, an example of zealots, that not in the Internet testamental period, but, but uh, after the, the first Jewish war, which was 66 to 70 A.D., the Battle of Masada took place in 73 A.D. And those were zealots. The Jews who had encased themselves in this fortress 
hideout or readout, as the English call it, which is a place you go to when you're in jeopardy. You have these, these, you know, these citadels you could go to to for protection, or or places that you could defend in a, that sense. Well, that's where the the Jews who stayed up in Masada and were finally destroyed by the 10th Legion of the Roman M- Army. Uh, they they were zealots, one of the other minor minor groupings of the Jews. But the two big ones were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They all had their rise during the intertestamental period. The Sadducees, because they were primarily the priesthood, they had been governing from before Malachi wrote, because Malachi took them to task significantly, scolding the priests because of their behavior. In Malachi, you can read that. After he was done, then they were still in power because the line of David was gone. And then about 300 years later, they gave more power to these Orthodox group called the uh, the Pharisees by teaching them to write and to read. Two other institutions uh, rose in the time. One was the synagogue. Even before the temple was completed, it seems the roots of the synagogue were found in Babylon and Persia. And then it was that, that operation moved it right back into the promised land when the Jews were allowed to return. It was a local gathering place for the Sabbath day where God's law was taught and expounded. So it wasn't only at the temple and probably, you know, in the long, in the, in, in the overview, the roots of the synagogue probably had some history back in the time of further into the time of ancient Israel as they were populating the area. But it became a very significant place. That was the political and religious base of the Pharisees as time went by up to the New Testament was the synagogue. They were the rulers of the synagogues. The Sadducees, being a high priest and, and the upper echelon of the priesthood, were the rulers at the temple. In essence, the Sadducees were the nobility within Judea uh, by the New Testament time, and it, this has existed for some time leading up to it. And the Pharisees were the leaders of the common people down below. So that gave the, the synagogue and then the Sanhedrin. We read of the Jewish council. In the King James, it's ran, translated as the council. Uh, usually, New King James renders it Sanhedrin. Uh, that's what council was just translated from that. Sanhedrin was the governing body of the Jews. Under the Herod family and under the Roman umbrella was the Sanhedrin. It was presided over by the high priest and the Sadducees. But it can included a whole lot of the Pharisees. So they were a power base in there. It was, it was a legislature and a supreme court at the same time. So Christ, the apostles were taken in front of the Sanhedrin. Christ was at times. That, that, had, that institution had developed during the intertestamental period, the Sanhedrin. And it is the 70. There were 70 of the leading elders, as they were considered in the, of the time, uh, that did the governing. Okay, well, any questions about the intertestamental period or what happened between the, the, the two testaments? Well, if not, then uh, I think we can go ahead and conclude that section. I will try to put a handout together to summarize some of these things for you so you have a handy review sheet. I just didn't quite have time since the feast to, to get that done. But when you understand how you shift from the Old Testament and then move through the 400 years and all the wars that took place and the developments of institutions that took place and then come out into the New Testament, a little bit of knowledge of the intertestamental period or between the testaments helps you appreciate the transition from one section of the Bible to the other.